I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. has captivated me since I was a boy. Now I travel through time for a living. In this series, I'll seek out the men and women who made a difference. And so the legend grew. Sparked revolutions. That's when the mutiny occurs. And met adversity head on. I want to shine a light on the moments when history changed forever. In his poem, If, British poet Rudyard Kipling advises us to meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. But I think that's easier said than done. Whether you're the victim of a tragedy. Abandon ship, abandon ship, abandon ship. Go to your muscle stations. Or the instigator of a catastrophe. And he became famous. We're talking about him 150 years after he died. Disaster will test you to the core and surviving it is all that matters. Most of the time, us humans do everything we can to avoid disaster. But for my first time travel, I've come to Sydney to meet someone who did exactly the opposite. Henri Lestrange was a 19th century daredevil. If he was strange by name, he was even stranger by nature. In 1877, he created a sensation when he tightrope walked to 100 metres above Sydney Harbour. So when people heard he was going up in a giant newfangled hot air balloon, they flocked to see what would happen. It was the year 1881. What could possibly go wrong with a hot air balloon flight? Well, quite a lot, actually. The gas that they used was coal gas, which was very flammable and also made you very giddy if you got too close to it. And as for the balloon itself, it was really heavy. So when he tried to take off, it just wouldn't budge. So what did he do? He cut the basket off the ropes and then he plaited the ropes together to form a sort of sling. And then he climbed onto the sling. But of course, now the balloon was too light, so when they let it go, he went hurtling off towards Wallamaloo. He was really worried now that he'd end up over the sea, so he let out some of the gas from the balloon. And the problem with that, though, was that he became so dizzy with the effects of the gas that he slipped out of his hoist. So now he's just dangling from the ropes. Surely the bloke was going to die. But no, finally the balloon began to descend on Woolloomooloo. But it wasn't a gentle, nice descent. This was helter-skelter smack down onto the houses of Palmer Street right here. And though you and I might think that was a really inglorious end, in fact, there was a huge crowd in the street and they cheered and lifted him onto their shoulders and took him, guess where to? Of course, the nearest pub for a celebration. But there's a very interesting postscript to this story. Stay there, Excuse me. Uh, can I come in for a minute? Thank you. There was a woman in the house, and when she heard all the fuss, she opened up the blinds to see what was happening. But of course, that sucked all the gas in from the balloon, which immediately ignited, blew the roof off her house, and lit up the entire area. 
Henri Lestrange caught a disaster and got away with it. But on my next time travel, the adventurers weren't so lucky. To meet them, I'm heading back 20 years. I've come to Melbourne on the trail of an extraordinary voyage which began on the 20th of August, 1860. Thousands of Australians go up and down this road in Royal Park in Melbourne every day, but I bet hardly any of them know what this extraordinary edifice is. It really is quite bizarre, isn't it? It actually marks the spot where Burke and Wills set off on their famous expedition. In the 70 years since colonisation, no one had crossed the continent from south to north. Many still believed that there was a great inland sea in the centre of Australia. So a group of prominent Victorians decided the first to do it would have to be one of their own. A pile of money was raised, and Robert O'Hara Burke, a country copper with no real bushcraft and poor leadership skills, was chosen to lead the cashed-up expedition. The man unfortunate enough to be his sidekick was William John Wills. The ambitious explorers would soon enter folklore for all the wrong reasons. 15,000 cheering people saw them go. One of their carts broke down before they'd even left the park and they only managed to make 11 kilometres on that first day. But then Burke turned round and galloped all the way back to Melbourne because he'd become obsessed by this 17-year-old girl and wanted to ask her to marry him. Whether or not she agreed, history doesn't record. What we do know is that he never laid eyes on her again. Burke and Wills led their expedition of 18 men, 22 horses and 25 ships of the desert into the unknown interior. Burke was ill-equipped in many ways to lead such a massive excursion, but not under-equipped by any means. The list of things that they took with them is really quite extraordinary. Pages and pages of the stuff, and such a lot of it, six tonnes of firewood, and very bizarre things like 16 pairs of blankets for Asiatics, four dozen assorted nipples, 12 dandruff brushes, 60 pounds of curled horsehair, I love this one, six kangaroo thongs, four dozen looking glasses for natives, and a Chinese gong. They certainly didn't die because they ran out of kit. Burke and Wills made it as far as Menindee, a tiny outpost in far western New South Wales. It's here that Burke started to go a bit balmy. He became paranoid that others would beat him in the cross-continental dash. So he divided the expedition, leaving several men and the bulk of supplies at Menindi. But that wasn't enough. At Cooper's Creek, Burke and Wills established a depot party before pushing on with just two other men, intending to be the first to cross the continent of Australia. Well, Burke had asked the depot party to wait at the Cooper Creek for three months. He thought that he could go from the Cooper halfway across Australia and back in about three months. Wills had the maps, he was a little bit more conservative, he realised how far they had to go and he'd asked the depot party to stay for four months. After four months the depot party decided they were going to leave. It took Burke four months and a week and they got back to the depot the day the depot party left. That is terrible luck. Yeah, absolutely terrible luck. They've walked across the continent, they've walked halfway back and they're just nine hours too late. But before they left, the depot party buried a cache of supplies. How did they survive? They went on half rations at first and then they went on quarter rations. The local Aborigines gave them food. They gave them rats. There was a plague of rats, so they had fat rats baked in their skins. They had fish. And this seed here, this is an aquatic fern. It's called an ardu, like a four-leaf clover. And once this stuff's died and dried out, it has a little seed, a sporocarp on the bottom, and this is what the seeds look like. And the Aborigines would grind this stuff into a flour, makes a sort of yellow flour, and they would either then make it into a dough and cook it in the fire as a, as a bread, as a damper, or they would uh, add a lot of extra water 
and have it as a, a gruel or a porridge. It's got quite a bit of taste. It hasn't got a lot of protein in there. Lots of taste. Mm. It's quite bitter. Yeah, it is. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really taste too much. But ironically, the Aborigines may well have killed them with kindness. Dave's theory is that it was the Nardu that finished them off. There's a toxin thymonase in there which wipes out vitamin B1 in the body. Because the Aborigines had it as part of a varied diet, it's not, uh, it doesn't have any real problems. But because Burke and Wills were living on this stuff exclusively, it gave them a, a disease called beriberi, wiped out all the vitamin B1 in the body. Whether it killed them or not, I'm not sure, but it certainly accelerated the deaths. And he got to the stage where Wills could no longer continue, and they built him a little shelter. They gathered him some nardu and some firewood and some water from the creek. His, his bones were almost through his skin and his elbows, and then he realised he was close to death, and you know, unless something turned up, he would die. And then Burke also couldn't continue, and in the morning, he, he died as well. So, ironically, Burke did get the fame that he'd been chasing. Yeah, he wanted the fame of being an explorer, and he became famous. We're talking about him 150 years after he died, but, yeah, unfortunately, he didn't get the fame quite the way he thought. He wanted to go back to Melbourne as a hero. He got fame by dying. As we look back from the 21st century, we can see that the tragic expedition wasn't a complete waste of time. It did complete the picture of inland Australia and proved once and for all there was no inland sea. The Burke and Wills debacle was plagued by human incompetence and pig-headedness. But as I time travel forward a century to the 1960s, I'm about to discover that even when people do their best, disaster can still strike. The New Zealand capital of Wellington is renowned for its windy weather. But on the 10th of April 1968, it would prove fatal. A storm blew that was crazier than any that anyone had ever seen. They call it a once in 500 year storm, 50 knots, that kind of power. And at the time it hit, the ferry from the South Island, the Wahine, was just coming into the harbour. It was just behind there somewhere which should have been OK. It was a, a fine ship. It was the, the pride of the fleet. At the helm of the Wahine was Captain Robertson, a commander with more than 40 years' experience at sea. Despite the worsening weather conditions, he was in full control of the ship when its radar suddenly failed. And it slammed into Barrett's roof, and it took off part of the propeller and the propeller shaft and water got into the engine room and the ship lost power. Once it had lost power, it had no control and it kept banging, bang, bang, bang into the reef, knocking holes into the side of it. Water came pouring in and there it was, aground on the reef. For the next five hours, captain and crew desperately tried to save the ship closing off the flooded vehicle deck and pumping out water. They kept the Wahine upright through the worst of the storm, but by 1.25 in the afternoon, she could take no more. With the Wahine listing dangerously, all passengers were ordered to abandon ship. You were actually on board the Wahine that morning, weren't you? Yes. You and your kids? Yeah. David, he was six, Alma three, and Gordy's birthday, he returned a year old. Did you realise quite how dangerous a situation you were in uh, when, when it hit Barrett Reef? Not really, not in a roundabout way, because we were told that she was a ship, you, all the whistles and bells, yeah. you, nothing would ever happen to her. Then eventually, they told you to get off the ship and get the kids off as well. said, abandon ship, abandon ship, abandon ship. Go to your muscle stations. Unable to swim, Shirley knew she needed help. So you were just stuck with these yeah. three kids, with the storm all yeah. around you. What, what did you do? Well, one steward came along and said that he'd take Alma and put her into a lifeboat. So you were then left with the two little yeah. boys? Yeah, and we had to go out onto the high side through the door. So we were standing there and I asked a couple of stewards to take David. 
He was slid down and put over the side onto a raft. So you had just got Gordy, who was, it was his first birthday? Yeah, yeah, we just sung happy birthday to him. And um, said to a steward, would you mind taking him, please? So he took him and he went over the side. So how did you get off? Just went and slid down and into the water. What was it like in the water? Cold. <laughs> but it was rough, it was horrible, it was... But when I looked up, I'd been in the water for a fair while, and I looked up and here was a fishing boat coming towards us. After more than an hour at sea, Shirley was rescued by one of the many local fishermen who headed out into the harbour that day. Miraculously, six-year-old David also made it safely to the shore. But sadly, the other children weren't so lucky. Little Alma was drowned when her lifeboat capsized. Gordy was rescued, but his life was cut short by his injuries. Tragically, 51 people lost their lives. Nevertheless, it is at times like this that communities pull together. Hundreds survived due to the efforts of a large rescue mission. You saved us from disaster and took us to a safe place. Thank you, signed the survivors. And do you know who ensured that that plaque was put up? Of course, it was Shirley. Memorials like these are important steps on the road to recovery. But on my next time travel, 40 years into the future, I'm seeing what happens when disaster destroys not just lives, but a whole city as well. Christchurch, a charming city on the South Island of New Zealand. I've come here to experience firsthand the resilience of its people. So, I'm on a punt on the River Avon, being punted along by a bloke in a boater. Got Oxford Terrace over here, Cambridge Terrace just behind me. This is a parody of Southern England, although a lot of people around here have always taken this parody very seriously as far as they're concerned. Christchurch is a quintessential version of England. It just happens to be 12,000 miles away from the English Channel. Thanks a lot. Christchurch was built in the image of the great cathedral cities of England. And for over a hundred years, locals and tourists alike have reveled in its elegant streetscapes, tram rides and architecture. But all that changed on Tuesday, the 22nd of February, 2011. It was the second major earthquake to hit in just six months. Measuring 6.3 on the Richter scale, it wasn't the size that made it so deadly, but the shallow depth, just five kilometers beneath the surface. 185 lives were lost. Thousands of already unstable homes and buildings buckled and collapsed. Good morning. All right, mate. If you see really pass it. The heart of this proud and beautiful town was virtually destroyed. Before the earthquake, this was the hub of the city, the very reason that Christchurch existed. And OK, there's still a lot of noise here, but it's not the sound of people and cars, it's the din of demolition. It looks like they're going to destroy virtually everything. Uh, over here, you've got what used to be one of the most exquisite, elegant, most famous buildings in the whole of the Southern Hemisphere, Christchurch Cathedral. Used to have this lovely tower, beautiful spire. Now, all of that has disappeared. Rebuilding the heart and soul of Christchurch is a gobsmackingly huge task. 
which has attracted an army of workers from all over New Zealand and the rest of the world, bringing their skills and their culture. What sells best? You do the British style donut kebabs, you can't get them anywhere else in New Zealand. The British style donut kebabs. <laughs> Good on you, mate. See you, See you later. I've left the South Cordon now, and I'm going into the uh, the North one. As you can see, it's the Isaac Theatre Royal here. I've played some ropey theatres in my life, but this just about takes the biscuit. Pre-earthquake, this was a beautiful old Edwardian theatre, and it will be again one day. It's one of the few buildings around here that will be restored to its former glory. But today, I'm more interested in what lay beneath it. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Tony. Catherine has one of the greatest jobs in world archaeology, I think. They ought to make a television series about <laughs> you. She hovers in the background while the earthquake is going on and everything's collapsing, and then rushes in and gets the archaeology. There's a slight overstatement, but that's basically your job, isn't it? But largely, yes, especially at the moment during this demolition phase. We're very much on call when something is found or when, we're, when somebody's working on a site where something might be found. We're there, and this is just a selection of what we got out of here. This looks pretty German. That's right. They contained German spring water, of all things, and the province that they came from existed from 1863 to 1865, but we know that they were manufacturing the spring waters until 1893, and they've been found on sites as far away as Mexico. It's Clearly the German unusual. workers like their spring water from back yeah. home, Yeah, <laughs> but not the beer, of... maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is lovely. Yeah, and we again, like the whole bottles, we don't normally find whole pieces of china. It's what you can see here, are these runs in the passion. It's actually a second. It's not a top quality piece. They're sending their seconds over to New Zealand to get rid of them because they weren't going to sell in the English market. You find the same thing quite a bit in Australia too. Any so, idea of a date? Um, we think about 1860s, so... Oh, and, so that's pretty early actually, isn't it, for Christchurch? Yeah, it's sort of 10 or so years after the first wave of European settlers have arrived. So it's, yeah, they're getting themselves set up and, yeah, starting life here. And starting to get some posh stuff, even if it is only seconds from England. Yes, that's right. Is there still, do you think, a lot of good archaeology lurking under the surface here? Absolutely. Yeah, there's <laughs> going to be lots more out there for people to find and for us to, yeah, learn more about. Well, so. Good luck with it. Great. See Thank ya. you. Around here, you don't have to search hard for evidence that this gutsy city is getting on with the business of, well, getting on. What was once a shopping strip called Cashel Street Mall is now a shipping strip optimistically called Restart Mall. A crazy jumble of cargo containers come shops, piled on cargo containers come cafes. Christchurch reborn. But remembrance still has a place. In the absence of a cathedral to mourn in, this vacant block has become a pop-up memorial. 185 empty white chairs represent every individual lost in the earthquake. This is a temporary one-person chapel, one of about 10 they plan to have dotted around Christchurch. Although the artist who built them says you don't have to pray in them if you don't want to, you can just sit here and think, or you can even use them as changing rooms if you like. There are beautiful pieces of poetry stuck on the walls, and over here is a list of all the people who died that you can contemplate while you're in here. On my time travels through disaster, I've been confronted with devastating loss and pain. But as awful as it is, calamity does have a way of captivating us, as I'm about to discover on a very strange trip back to the 70s. In South Australia, the fascination with disaster once stopped a city in its tracks. Does anyone need Please. Going to Glenelg. The 70s were renowned for being psychedelic, but what happened at a beachside suburb of Adelaide was way out even by the standards of those days. This is Glenelg Beach, a holiday playground for Adelaide folk. But in the summer of 1976, a house painter from Victoria called John Nash predicted that there would be a huge tidal wave hitting the beach and then going on to engulf and eradicate Adelaide. A 
As implausible as it sounds, many Adelaideans took the prediction seriously. House prices fell, seaside hotels went bust, and hundreds of people packed up their stuff and headed for the hills. But not everyone adopted that kind of attitude. Rick, you were down here waiting for the calamity, weren't you? How did you hear about it? Well, this man made this prediction, although he'd never been to Glenelg, and it started to take off under its own weight. People actually got frightened about it. They, they took it seriously. And yet, on the other hand, a load of people came down here, didn't they? Thousands of people came down here. I bought my kids. That's how frightened I was. And we all came down here. People were in dinner suits. They were in flippers and goggles. They had water wings, uh, surfboards. People came down with swimming pools and were sitting in swimming pools, all waiting for this tidal wave, which we all knew wasn't going to happen. This was a lovely piece of Australian humour, in my view. And they laughed at themselves, and it, and it was a, a terrific reaction. Don't forget, Tony, that we had just come out of a constitutional crisis. In 1975, two months earlier, the Queen's representative, the Governor-General, had sacked the government. Yeah, yeah. The country was sort of divided. It was very tense. And I think people looked for this release. They looked for the laugh. They, they, they wanted to have fun. And they certainly got it, oh, didn't they? It was great fun. It was really great fun. And we all laughed at each other. And of course, nothing happened. This whole business had become such a big deal that they had local news teams here, international news teams. Even the Premier of South Australia, Don Dunstan, was here waving and saying to everyone, it's all right, everything's going to be fine. I love this poster here that says, repent, the end is near. And just behind it, surfs up. Anyway, just before midday, the countdown began. 10, 9, 8, 7, and when they got to zero, Nothing happened. Everyone laughed, there was a bit of cheering, and then they all just toddled off. But have a look at that photo of Don Dunstan again. See, he's 10 metres up in the air. He wasn't taking any chances, was he? If only I could have travelled back to 1976, I could have saved everyone a whole lot of trouble. Mind you, that might have spoiled all the fun. There's a lot we can learn from disaster. Sometimes it's about doing things better. Other times, it's about the strength of the human spirit to carry on. But perhaps the greatest lesson is that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Now that's something worth taking into the future.